I wanted to go uh, over to John Gray, who has a somewhat different view. Uh, many of you have read his books, seen his, his writing in a variety of publications. He's now formally emeritus professor of European thought at the London School of Economics. John, a few thoughts on uh, the survival of the euro. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I think over the medium term of um, 10, 15, possibly 20 years, it can't survive. Um, of course, it has been stabilized through the crisis of the last year or so, and many supporters of the euro going back 20 years when I heard a talk by Oscar Fischer stating this view, anticipated that there would be great crises and argued that the result of the crises would be to strengthen the euro. So for supporters of the euro, this is not um, anything uh, new. Uh, but I don't think the euro has been strengthened. It's been stabilized at the level of the currency and the banking system, but at enormous social and human and economic cost in the Mediterranean countries. Um, I don't think we sufficiently uh, uh, grasp the depth of the human and social damage involved in nearly two-thirds of Spanish youth, that's to say people under 25, being outside the labor market, unemployed, for many years, with many years on current policies, even if they're tweaked at the edges after uh, the recent election in um, Germany, many years uh, of policies producing maybe five or seven or ten more years of mass unemployment in large parts of Europe. Uh, what will be the fates of these young people, not even looking at the older ones for the time being, if they've been out of the labor market for 5, 10, 15 years. It's a recipe, I think, for profound social alienation and ultimately for political instability. But the ultimate reason why I don't think the euro can survive is that as supporters of the euro constantly remind us, it'll only work with banking union and ultimately banking union, fiscal transfers, all the rest of it can only work with political union. And I don't think uh, a, a political union uh, in a Europe of this size, a Eurozone, a Euroland of this size, maybe if it was smaller, if it had stayed smaller, if it had been a monetary union of a few closely similar countries, it could have endured and possibly or possibly not turned into a political union. But at the size that it is now with the membership that it has now, I think um, there cannot be anything like a functioning democracy. And more generally, although I'm no fan of the nation state or of nationalism, um, the lesson uh, of the last um, decades uh, and of much of the last century is that the upper limit of democracy and also of political legitimacy is the nation state. There are a few multinational <coughs> nation states left in the world, uh, Canada, um, Spain, uh, Belgium, the United Kingdom, but they're all relics of monarchy or empire. Um, there are no uh, functioning transnational democratic institutions, and I don't think there will be. Now, of course, you can take the view that um, we can't know in advance what's possible or impossible. If something looks impossible, we should test it in the experimental laboratory of history. That's been a disaster throughout the 20th century. Um, I don't think this promises to be different, where Europe is a zone of peace, one of the achievements of the European Union in its earlier phase was a long period of peace. It was built largely by the people who supported it, primarily and before it was an economic union as a, as a means of peace. But we've also seen in more recent times that when conflict breaks out in the European continent, as it did in the Balkans, um, the, Euro the, the European, European institutions were powerless to uh, intervene unless there'd been an intervention by American armed force, unless American power uh, uh, was exercised as it was, there would have been no resolution of the Balkan um, conflict of the kind that there has. The European institutions are now heavily involved there, but they couldn't have been heavily involved there if American power hadn't <coughs> been employed as it was. In terms of sort of its, its reach into the Balkans and that part of the post-communist world, it was pretty um, useless. So um, I think um, my view is it, it can't survive, just to speak of my own country, um, um, 
uh, there may be uh, a referendum on the Europe on on the on 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 EU membership on EU membership. I don't think there are any practicable political circumstances in which Britain could, in any foreseeable time, join the euro. I think that's off the agenda, probably permanently. Equally, however, it's quite feasible that if there is a referendum, and there'll only be a referendum at the moment because Labour has declined to commit itself to a referendum if uh, another coalition is formed with the Conservative Party in the dominant seat, um, if there is a referendum, I think it could well not deliver the result of an exit result. That's to say, to put it the other way around, I think the preference of the British voters might be to remain semi-detached and not to decide. So in that case, there might be a relatively narrow win. Um, so the preference of uh, the majority, the British majority, and of thereby, uh, ultimately, of the political class, I think, is to remain semi-detached. And in that context, whatever happens in Europe, and if Europe does become more integrated prior to what I view as a, an eventual collapse, Britain will become more semi-detached as, as Europe becomes more integrated. Whatever happens in Europe, Britain will not take part in the experiment. And I'm myself glad that that is the case, um, because I, although what happens in Europe affects us greatly, although we have a tremendous amount of trade with Europe, the deep commingling of fates that's involved in uh, um, uh, in joining a, uh, a project of political union, which I regard as essentially um, impossible of achievement, I think is one which um, uh, um, the British public, the British voters, will reluct from and will continue to reluct from, partly because had we been in the Euro, had we joined as, for example, Blair, his, one of, his kind of, one of his many visions by which he was intoxicated, was that after we'd uh, joined the United States in a quick war of weeks or two or three months in Iraq, and Blair had been swept through Baghdad with uh, flowers thrown over him and so on. He would come back. It's not made up. This is what he, I think, had in mind for a while. Um, there would be a quick referendum on entering the Euro, and we'd have gone in. Had we gone in, we would now be in a position rather like that of Era Island multiplied by about 10. Um, so the fact that we've stayed out, the fact that the so-called austerity policies, which are not that austere, have prevailed, by the way, partly because we've been able to devalue our currency, which we wouldn't have been able to do if we'd been in. That's what really did it, having continuing control of our own currency. Um, the British people, without paying deep attention to this, because Europe is about seventh or eighth on their list of priorities, any aspect of Europe, um, have the sense, the unconscious sense, that we're much better off. Uh, out of it and will remain out of it pretty well whatever happens. Um, if it breaks down, and then I'll conclude, if it breaks down, how will that affect the world? Well, I think one of the risks here is to have an, an introverted European perspective. A breakdown of the euro, a collapse of the euro, would certainly be a very large event and it would certainly affect many parts of the world. But it wouldn't be larger than the, in the impact on the world than that of a Chinese economic collapse or even a rapid slowdown or to take a, a more likely uh, possibility, although I don't say it's very likely, a failure of abenomics, a large-scale failure of abenomics, could have an absolutely cataclysmic effect on the world economy. Um, so Europe isn't at the center of the world, even in the event of a cataclysm. There are many other things that could happen which would be equally or more catac uh, um, uh, cata cataclysmic. Back in 1919, the poet Paul Valéry wrote a wonderful essay on the future of Europe, in which, by the way, he said the secret European dream is to be governed by an American commission. <laughs> uh, I think that's, uh, uh, under all the anti-Euro-Americanism, I think that's still a kind of dream. He said, we are too burdened to buy our history. Perhaps we can... Uh, John, let's, let's return I'm, to I'm some sure of those. I'm sure you have lots to respond to. I think you'd try and put it a little bit in the context, and you already have to some degree, about whether the euro should survive and what would yeah. happen if it doesn't. And yeah. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on democracy. One of the ironies in the US and in Europe is that the purely non-democratic Federal Reserve mm. and the ECB were the ones who had the most, mm. uh, in the American term, liberal policies, and who, by and large, have so far at least saved the day. But John. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll say something about whether it ought to survive and then something about the consequences of it not surviving if that, if that happens. Um, I hesitate to quote a 
European dictator, particularly not one uh, one who was not known for his sense of humor, but um, <laughs> Mussolini observed somewhere, it's his only re recorded joke, if he meant it as a joke, that ru it, ruling Italy was not impossibly difficult, simply pointless. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and I guess at the back of this is the idea that if this absurd project founders, then we have chaos, catastrophe, disaster, murder, that it's the only possible, that there is no alternative to it. Um, well, I mean, uh, um, uh, James Galbraith has al already pointed to a number of alternatives that could perhaps be explored within the existing structures, though I'm doubtful myself if any of them will be explored in time and on a large enough scale to prevent uh, a further crisis. So I think it would be better now to start thinking about how to adapt to a major crisis um, further down the road. Uh, uh, we can't know, it could be because of an external event, it could be because of internal political uh, developments, but let me just underscore one point, which is a feature which has been commented upon by James and others, but which I think is not sufficiently appreciated. One of the features of Europe today is a return of the classical European demons of poisoned pathological politics. Practically every European country, some worse than others, Greece for obvious reasons, but not only Greece, Hungary, and also, by the way, Italy, have seen uh, a return of anti-Semitic, anti-Roma, anti-gay, uh, anti-immigrant uh, policies, mm -hmm. not just on the fringes of politics, but really poisoning the whole democratic culture in these countries. So the risk, I don't think, is at all of revival of any kind of classical interwar um, dictatorship, but of a poisoned and um, uh, 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 um, distorted and deformed uh, democratic uh, uh, politics, which even with respect to the center parties, the non-extremist parties, are conditioned by the return of these uh, pathologies. Now, one response to that is say, that just shows the project hasn't been pursued vigorously enough consistently enough, it must be altered in various ways, press on, uh, it will eventually come out in the wash. I think not. My, uh, I think um, uh, the depth and profundity of the youth unemployment of the social alienation of the fact that in some countries recruitment into the far-right parties is fastest among the young and is often mediated by the internet um, is something we should be uh, well aware of. How does that um, uh, um, affect uh, Britain's position, well, I'm not afraid of the consequence if it ultimately comes to it that we exit. Um, uh, I don't regard that as um, in any sense uh, disastrous. What I think we're seeing now in a sense is that half of Europe, half of 21st century Europe is being sacrificed in order to solve the 20th century German question. And I'm not sure that's a reasonable trade-off. Um, if really we need to, uh, uh, if really um, we have to make a choice in Britain, and as I've said, the preference will be not to make it, but that doesn't mean the willingness to make it in the end is absent. Um, uh, uh, as to whether to commingle our fates with this vast and already uh, tarnished and even failing experiment or um, uh, exit, then I think uh, the likelihood is we'll exit, and I would support that. A uh, final point is it's, we don't, Europe doesn't have um, uh, 30 or 40 years in which to uh, uh, study its own navel and comment on the uh, um, uh, changes that may or may not occur because of relatively short-term and inconsequential changes in European politics. The rest of the world is changing much more rapidly than that. Back in 1859, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill in his book on liberty wrote in the introduction of European dynamism, I think he used the word energy, and Chinese stationariness. Nobody would now talk about European dynamism. It's a sort of semi-paralyzed con con confident, rich in parts of it, the northern parts, doing well, reasonably well for Rob, but though with lots of inequality and poverty uh, in uh, northern uh, Europe as well, in Germany, no minimum wage, for example. Um, these are all problems which people say will be addressed but no one could describe Europe as being um, convulsed by dynamism or China as being languishing in the depths of uh, lethargic stationariness. 
the world won't hang on, it won't wait. Um, if uh, uh, it, will, it will focus on what's actually happening, it will try, as politicians and governments always do, not to pre-commit themselves too much. But if there is a major crisis in, in, in the Eurozone, I think it'll be, it'll be big for obvious reasons. But I just make one comment since I'm speaking in America. I wouldn't assume, I wouldn't take for granted that the net result would be damaging to the US. Obviously, American stock markets, bond markets could be shaken. But even as things are, America is um, the haven for global capital at the moment. It's flowing from the emerging markets back into America. If there was a major crisis in Europe, that could even accelerate um, uh, that rate. I don't, I think the American experiment, so to speak, of a building a, a genuine nation state, which Europe will never be, um, uh, has produced something resilient enough that actually the on balance, the net effect, could actually be um, uh, 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 benign in the case of, um, in the, in the case of uh, uh, America. So um, I think we're not in the early stages or the middle of a highly success of, 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 of an experiment which um, has problems, which is tarnished, which is difficult, but nonetheless will go on. We're in a period of uh, artificial stasis and of artificial uh, stabilization of institutions that are essentially um, uh, um, unworkable. And in that context, um, the British position of remaining detached, whatever its sort of historical reasons, the German support of this project also, but profoundly historical reasons, the German question which dominated the dark continent in much of the 20th century, both emerged from my history, I think that position in Britain um, has turned out to be um, not through any excessive wisdom uh, on our part, but uh, um, has turned out to be uh, um, the right one uh, that we've adopted. So whatever will happen, we will remain on the side. And uh, uh, European Germans and others may say that's a, a great tragedy. If so, it's one we can John, live with. Final thoughts? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, I guess one of the interesting features of the last five years is that um, a, an integral component of the European project, which was there from the start, um, has been shredded. Uh, right from the start and throughout the 70s and 80s, um, uh, the idea was that European capitalism was superior to, or the varieties of capitalisms that existed in Europe were superior to the diabolical um, um, uh, Anglo-American market individualist model. They were more collaborative, they paid more attention to social cohesion, and so on. Well, no one could say that now, uh, whether even in the case of Germany, and certainly not in the case of the periphery, peripheral countries. So the, the, the attachment of the left to a European project is wholly anachronistic, as indeed the project itself um, has become, partly for the reason that's just been said. When a government in a founder member uh, European uh, country like um, the Netherlands says, um, the welfare state's over, welfare institutions are over, at a time when tens of millions of Europeans are suffering um, fairly extreme forms of hardship with no prospect, uh, no reliable project prospect. Will the wisps emerging from the uh, uh, um, uh, intricacies and um, labyrinth of German politics, but nothing more, uh, of any fundamental change of policy. I think it's clear that that's gone. So in this, so that the, the notion that of, European, of Europe embodying a higher, a better, a more intelligent, a more humane, a more socially inclusive form of capitalism is gone. And I think that's one of several realities we should accept. And here, this respect, I do agree with Emmanuel. Um, I think this is one of those periods in history, one of those moments in history, where what we ought to do, what enlightened opinion ought to implement, what can be done, what tweakings and reforms can occur, are really of secondary significance to what is actually happening and is likely to Freud, happen. Freud, in one of his wise observations, said it is only in logic that contradictions are forbidden. <laughs> and one of the contradictions we see at the moment is that the project of transcending national sovereignty in Europe is um, advancing through um, a completely national project, that of the Germans, which I, I agree with um, Emmanuel uh, um, uh, on that. Um, I think what I would uh, just want to emphasize, is it's not that I want the project to collapse, it's that large-scale projects like the European project, which run into insoluble difficulties, are never rationally dismantled.
uh, they simply collapse. The risk, I think, in Europe is more that unlike the Soviet project, which at least had the energy to collapse, at least had the built-in in <laughs> a possibility of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a heroic reformer who unwittingly produced a collapse, that this situation in Europe may actually continue for decades. Well, the American experiment is still going. Yes, but Europe is not American. One of the fundamental errors of American opinion is to assume that Europe can, re can recapitulate American nation building. Uh, this is a fundamental error, and I think one of the great challenges in America as the crisis develops, and here I do agree with Emmanuel, is to recognize that that was always mistaken, um, that America was a largely an occupied country. There were indigenous peoples, but it wasn't uh, constituted by uh, uh, longstanding historic nations as Europe is, uh, densely populated and so on. It's completely impossible, in my view, to recapitulate that uh, experiment in Europe. And I think as long as Americans think that it can be uh, recapitulated, they'll be blind to what's actually going on in Europe.